Uh, so first of all, I want to say thank you and welcome to Attorney General Josh Stein from the great state of North Carolina. Um, I know that uh, I'm a mother of four, and I believe uh, you are a father of two, three. Three. Great. So I think um, because we're parents, we're having a serious conversation about a serious topic, but because we're both parents, I appreciate your saying we can call, I can call you Josh, which I will do. Um, and so Josh, I, I think we should just jump right in. Sure. Um, you are, as I said, Attorney General from North Carolina and among your many achievements, um, one is that uh, you uh, were the first to go, potentially go to trial against Jewel uh, when you joined us again generously a year ago. Uh, uh, you were about to go to trial. I think then you were in conversation with your colleague, uh, Maura Healy from Massachusetts. Uh, and now a year later, um, you are the holder of the first major settlement against Jewel. Um, so I, I think my first question uh, is this. Um, I know on July 1st, there will be documents that were sealed as part of the settlement that are going to be made public. And um, I think I would love to know, uh, you may, I'm sure you cannot say specifically, but if there is some way you can generally uh, explain what, what those documents are about, why it was so important for you to steal them, how uh, it may be important for some of your colleagues and suits going forward once they're public, and most importantly, how will they be made public? Because I know that I certainly am very eager to see them, and I know that there are likely many people who are listening to us today who will also be interested to see what is in those. Well, the fundamental principle is one of transparency. We want the public, all the people, to know what happened. What were the uh, decisions and actions that were made by the executives of Juul, the e-cigarette company, that led to their absolutely explosive growth among North Carolina and American teenagers. Uh, and so uh, it all comes down to transparency. We didn't want anything swept under the rug. And the deal is that it will be shared with uh, University of North Carolina School of Public Health. And we are working with those partners to get the documents in an accessible form to the general public. Uh, we will be announcing when the go live date is and information about how people can access the data as we work through technological issues, uh, because it really is uh, voluminous. The amount of material is, is, is a great deal. So they won't be suddenly public online on North Carolina jeweldocuments.com on July 1st. Um, when do you expect that there will be a public announcement about how they will be made public? These are technical questions beyond my knowledge. And they, okay. They, they um, purposefully keep me out of these kinds of questions. Okay, sorry. I apologize. I apologize. Lack I apologize. Of capacity. Um, but it's good. To, and I just also, one last technical question, if, if you may, um, and that is, um, uh, is Juul responsible for uh, funding the um, publication or the making public of these documents, or is that something that um, the state or um, or the school is taking on responsibility for? It, it was part of the deal that it, when we settled with them, um, their funding the transfer was it was a permissible use of the funds. Great. Um, I guess I'd love to ask. Um, you know, do you do you believe that there will be material that becomes public that will have either an impact on um, other state cases, other potential settlements, or even on cases that are being brought? Um, you know, in um, you know the MDL, the multi district um, cases, or in other private cases. I mean, what will there be things that that could have an impact on things going forward? I, conceivably, it could impact. Some of the other cases that are happening, there are, I think, about a dozen other AGs that have active cases and 30 plus are involved in a multi-state. And then there are private actors who are in this multi-district litigation you referenced. But my guess is, is that all of those parties have substantially all of the material that we got in the course of our litigation because they've been engaged in an investigation and in discovery for some time now as well. Um, so I think the primary value of this depository will just be to people, to interested Americans, to researchers, to public health advocates, so that they can see exactly what decisions were made in real time and how they were talked about, what factors 
the management considered when they decided to pursue one strategy over another. Um, so we just wanted there to be full transparency in the belief that the more the public understands how uh, things like Jules' explosion uh, among teenagers and the consequent uh, problems of teen nicotine addiction, uh, then it makes it less likely these things will happen in the future. Um, I guess I want to back up a little bit. This is a is something I might not have asked, but for the very, very recent uh, news um, that FDA in its own court filing as part of a U.S. district uh, suit that was brought to expedite the much, much delayed and ongoing PMTA process, right? The FDA's, um, uh, you know, the products that have been on the market, these flavored products that we know have addicted millions of kids since 2016, and that the deadline was moved up to 2021. And then we just within the last couple of days uh, learned that FDA has told the judge who gave them the deadline of 2021 that in fact, they won't be done. They're already eight months past that deadline. And now, sorry, but we won't be done with that process till 2023. So I think it's really important to know how, I certainly know as a, as a parent and as a co-founder of this group in touch with parents and families all across the country that you know the notion that these products will be allowed potentially to remain on the market, menthol products among the most popular flavors kids use who vape to, to hang out for another year at least has terrible consequences, right? It doesn't allow us to stop this problem and it allows, we believe, younger kids to start. But from your perspective um, as uh, an, a state attorney general and particularly the North Carolina state attorney general, uh, what do you think of, of this delay? What kind of an impact will that have on the, uh, the, the, the cases and the landscape? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed like anyone else who cares uh, about trying to bring resolution to these issues as quickly as possible to improve the health of American youth. Um, you know, the FDA is dealing with immense challenges from the pandemic. And so I'm certain that it's affected their internal dynamics and ability to make decisions. But, you know, they've talked about prioritization. They did ban, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of, of products and flavors uh, in the initial way, which was good, but you know, if, if Juul and Puff Bar and a couple of these others represent a large market share among teenagers, then I, I urge them to act with as much speed and expedition as they possibly can to at least start working their way down the list. Um, and uh, you know, it was a positive step that they uh, are. Um, willing, you know, Congress authorized them to go after the synthetic nicotine products. And uh, I'm urging the FDA to, to act in that regard. So I think that having the FDA move with as much uh, expedition as possible, obviously is in the national interest. And, uh, you know, we urge them to do so. Right, right. Thank you. Um, and getting back to the you, to the North Carolina settlement, um, which I believe uh, was for the the, for the financial uh, component was, if I hope I'm correct, forty million dollars. Million dollars. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we've noted is that um, the cases, the settlements that have followed yours, um, the financial piece is actually getting smaller rather than larger. And in, in, in situations like this, usually you see the opposite, that the numbers go up. And I wonder if you could sort of give us the context for that, um, you know, why that would be. Obviously, $40 million is an enormous amount of money. I think there are people out there who would say that um, in the context of how much Juul has made profiting off uh, our, our youth who, who, who were, you know, targeted on social media, et cetera, we don't have to relitigate that with the attorney general right here um that you know that's a lot of money you know but it's you know how much have they made but leaving that aside why are the numbers going down and not up it seems counterintuitive to someone who is not a lawyer or an attorney general well a lot of factors go into arriving at a number in a settlement uh can include the strength of the case it could include the exposure to the defendants and you know, each case is different, you know, the, the dynamics of what is state law, what pretrial motions, you know, how's the, the judge 
uh, responding to the arguments, all of these things are elements that can shape the resolution of a case. The, the belief on the part of the defendant about the vigor with which the plaintiff will bring the case, you know, these all factor in. So, you know, we uh, felt very strongly about our case, thought we had a compelling case, thought uh, we were going to, we would win, but concluded that the resolution where we got secured not only real dollars out of, out of the company, but dramatic changes to the way they did business that would better insulate young people from the product. And for us, we made the calculus that that was the appropriate resolution. And I think if you nationalized what, uh, based on our market share for the country, it made it like a, about a $1.5 billion national deal, which um, at that point of Jules market value, it, it was a substantial percentage of the entire net worth of the company. Now, what you said about the founders and original investors making a ton of money, they did. I mean, they walked away with the founders, hundreds of millions of dollars and the early investors, billions of dollars. And since I brought my action against Jew, Jewel, I've sued them because I think that they need to pay because they played an instrumental role in shaping the business decisions uh, of the company. So um, each, each case is different. Each plaintiff comes up with their own conclusion. I, I, I went first, I was the first, AG to take them to court. We were the first state to hold them accountable. And I made clear to them that not only were they going to have to pay a real dollar, a, a lot of money to get me to, to settle, but I was going to protect North Carolina's interest in any subsequent settlement in, in the next few years. If somehow they were paying a lot more than what they paid us, we had a most favored nations clause right. to make sure that we would go up too. Right. And, but but again, and I, I, a couple of things you said I always want to follow up on. One is, though, but the numbers have gone down. And I wonder, I understand each case is different and each calculation, but um, uh, it's just surprising that the numbers have gone down and not up. And I wonder, um, uh, you know, why that would be. It's disappointing um, for those of us, particularly parents who uh, feel that Juul, which, you know, there's been plenty of FDA statements and congressional testimony, uh, including from us and our, our sons, you know, where there is real evidence that there was there was marketing directly to young people, um, to think that Juul, that the cases uh, are, the settlements are getting smaller rather than larger. And, you know, coupling that with the accessibility, which we spoke about earlier, that these products remain on the market. You know, Juul's menthol uh, remains on the market. We know that, you know, all Juul needs to do or any of these products is get menthol approved because that's already among the most popular flavors for teens. And then they can just go on about their business and continue with those sales to minors. So um, do you have any further thoughts? And it's fine if not. Um, <laughs> about why those are getting smaller? Do you think there will be a tipping point at which they begin to go back up, maybe closer to what you got, or is there no way to know? All I can do is represent the people of North Carolina. You know, none of the other AGs ever asked me what the right number is for their states. And so I have absolutely no uh, insight into what's driving these other cases in other states. All I can tell you is I, I felt like heck for my people. I, and that is not in dispute. Um, and, and by the way, and leading it and being the first and to get a settlement, um, while that was a case for the people of North Carolina, and we have many parents in North Carolina, I know they appreciate it. All of us who care about holding Jewel accountable appreciate what you've done and what your colleagues have done and continue to do. Um, sure. You mentioned your, uh, you are suing uh, some of the owners and the um the principal investors. Um, can you give us a sort of a status on, on where that's going? I also, uh, as part of that, I know that you had announced you are doing an investigation into Puff Bar, which of course, as we all know, um, is uh, based on what FDA has told us and CDC that that is the most popular brand being used by teens. Of course, they claimed they were using synthetic nicotine and they were just last week supposed to have applied for a PMTA. FDA hasn't told us if they have. Um, can you give us a status on both of those? Sure. Um, well, the founders of Juul, Monsies and Bowen, James Monsies and Adam Bowen, uh, they made so much money, ridiculous sums of money, and they were absolutely instrumentally involved in the decisions of the company and, and making the decisions that we believe uh, expose them to liability for going after kids. 
And so we want to hold them accountable and we want to get more money for North Carolina people who are affected so we can put it to good use for prevention and, and treatment of opioid dependence. The, the case is ongoing. These cases are very complex. We're in discovery uh, and in pretrial motions now. And you know, I wish I could tell you there was a, a date certain by when we would get an ultimate resolution, but that's just not the way complex litigation works. You know, we will push the case forward as aggressively as we possibly can to ensure that we do the absolute best we can by, by people of North Carolina. Um, Puff Bar, you know, this is the new jewel. I mean, they've, by market data, it appears that they are the number one product that young people are doing. And instead of um, having refillable cartridges, they're disposable. You use it and then and throw it away. Um, and so we are investigating them to determine what acts they have taken and to see whether those business decisions expose them to a civil liability under our, our consumer protection laws. And you know, once we've finished our investigation and we've been getting the information uh, at, that we've been requesting, then we'll make that decision of whether to bring a lawsuit or not. Um, but what I think Puff Bar really underscores is the concept of, of whack-a-mole, that there will always be another company that comes along. You know, let's say, you know, I think Jules practices are much more responsible. They've dramatically changed the way they market so that they're not going to appeal to kids. They've changed the way they sell the product in order to improve protections against young people being able to acquire the product. Um, but it didn't solve all the problems because there are other competitors who aren't, uh, haven't made those changes. So the FDA needs to come in as a regulatory body and come up with rules that apply to the entire industry, regardless of which company it is. Marketing and sales, advertising, use of flavors, ment menthol, you mentioned menthol, um, the concentration of nicotine that are in these products that accelerate young people's chemical dependence on them. So these are all things that I've urged the FDA to do, other AGs have urged the FDA to do, and advocacy groups like you all and some of your allied organizations have urged the FDA to do. And so we, we will keep pushing, pre putting pressure on them to come up with protections that apply to the whole industry. Um, but until they do, I'm gonna continue my work of identifying bad actors who violate our state law uh, and protecting North Carolina kids. Cause I really do think one of the most important things an AG can do is to protect vulnerable people. And often that is young people. Right. No, I, we appreciate that. And you're right. I mean, certainly Puff Bar um, has a long history, by the way, of um, of trying um, and often succeeding, innovating the rules. Uh, the use of synthetic is is one of them. And I, I understand what you're saying about um, for you that what was most important was that the practices changed. I guess I would say um, two things. One is a question and one is a comment. I'll say the comment first, which is, you know, Jewel may, um, I would like to believe that the company has made all of these wonderful changes. But the reality is, um, based on what they, they publicly state, that they don't want to be uh, in the business of having minors use their products. Well, then if they really felt that way, they would have, when they saw the figures uh, two years ago about youth use of menthol, they would have immediately withdrawn menthol from the market as they did other flavors. Um, but when they, you know, which they made a lot of public noise about, but they have not, nor did they withdraw their PMTA for menthol which again, we know from the, the federal data is among the most popular youth flavors. So that, you know, I have to say, that's, as, a, speaking for myself, that's a completely fair critique. Absolutely. Right. I also wonder in, in the settlement, um, is Juul responsible for following up on the changes that they made based on the settlement? Or is the state uh, responsible for monitoring? And maybe it's because I'm paranoid because we have firsthand knowledge, as I think you know, of you know a jewel rep coming into our kids' school and speaking directly to kids. So, um, uh, and I think lots of people are concerned about the, the ongoing motivation. So, what is the monitoring like for the settlement? Well, there are different elements that have different types of monitoring. For instance, one of the requirements we had in the settlement was a secret shopper program where they have to contract with an independent organization and send young people who appear right at that 
18 to 21 year age window to go in and try to buy their product. And they have to do this repeatedly over the course of the year, hundreds and hundreds of times. And then depending on what happens, if the retailer ends up consummating the sale without getting the person's identification, there are increasing sanctions to that retailer uh, up to and including cutting them off and no longer selling the product in that retail. And Juul uh, provides us those reports on a quarterly basis of how the secret shopper program is going. The other things are, it just if we learn of violations, uh, if they are doing things, like you say that they sent somebody into a school, if that happened in North Carolina, I need to know about that because then I can go and seek enforcement of the consent agreement that they made. It's an order of the court. And if they're violating it, they expose themselves to serious penalty. And uh, I, for that reason, I would be surprised if they are doing anything in violation of the agreement. But the way these things work is if we get noticed that it's happening, then we will hold them accountable for violating what they agreed to do. So I want to, I have two final questions. I appreciate so much your time and your candor and, and your wisdom on this. Um, and, and one is, you know, what, what you just spoke about, um, that relates to, you know, we're, because we are a national grassroots parents organization powered by parent volunteers, um, we really focus on what are ways in which parents can take action or participate um, in the process of protecting kids. And so what would you say, um, you know, both in your own state and maybe more broadly as, as you have more and more colleagues settling or investigating, um, what are ways that parents can, um, you know, can amplify the importance of these settlements? You know, what, what should parents be doing to, um, to remain vigilant or how can they participate in, in the process um, either of state litigation or, um, uh, you know, being in communication with your office or other offices if there are, um, if there are violations and there enforcement, as you well know, uh, there it's very, very hard to enforce, as you said earlier, because as long as these products are not re completely regulated by FDA, they're available um, overall without, uh, you know, a comprehensive um, policy, it's whack-a-mole. And, and we don't have the time to waste because these are children and the window will be closing on a healthy future if they are addicted to these products because they can become lifetime customers of, of Juul and others. Or, or they become much more susceptible to other forms of addiction later in life. Yes. You know, once, once you've created a neural pathway in a teenage brain to any type of addiction, it really creates great risks for them for and cocaine, alcohol, methamphetamine. Right, it reprograms the prefrontal cortex for addiction. We've spoken a lot about that today. That's right. Thank you. So there are things that people can do individually on their own, but also as part of a collective. And I think that if people want to add their voice to a larger whole, finding out about advocacy organizations like yours, and there are plenty of others that do similar work. And so find some group that you feel um, articulates your view of what you think should happen because the more members you have, the more effective your organization is going to be. Um, but you can also, if you don't, if you're not a joiner, you can still have an impact. You can write the FDA. Every letter they get that tells them to act makes it more likely that they will act because there are countervailing voices on the other side saying, don't act, don't act, don't act. Um, so that's one thing. You can contact your federal representatives and say, look, the FDA, which you oversee as a member of Congress, is not acting as quickly or as thoroughly as we believe they should. You need to write the FDA and tell them to get their act together or pass a law like they just did on the chemical nicotine. That was a good move by Congress. And that only happened because people were notifying them about the problem. Um, and then I mean, talk to AGs across the country. This issue really got on my radar because I had two buddies of mine within about a week of each other independently tell me how their son, who both of them were in ninth grade at the same time, because my daughter was in ninth grade at that time, so this was four years ago, had their lives absolutely spiral out of control because of Jewel. 
They had to switch school. They needed to get medical care. They were completely addicted to this new chemical. And it was just having an incredibly painful impact on that child and the entire family. And me hearing those stories at the same time, sorry about that, at the same time, the Surgeon General and the FDA Commissioner were articulating there was an epidemic of youth vaping. All of that happened that said to me, uh, and I had teenagers, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Someone has to do something. And so that's when I commenced my investigation of Jewel. Maura Healy had also started one up in Massachusetts. And in the course of doing our investigation, I became more and more convinced that these were, that, that, that the epidemic was a consequence of business decisions to make more money at the expense of America's youth. And I was outraged, so I filed an action and we've talked about the result. Right. Well, I, and, and I have to say, you know, as you said, uh, we are the, the first national parent voice fighting the tobacco industry. Um, so I agree with you that um, that voice parents voices do matter, that stories of uh, and which is sadly is we hear this every single day from all from North Carolina and, and all 49 other other states out there, you know, that that this has not gone away. Um, and on that point, I guess I, I want to uh, finish by asking you, um, a lot of people uh, who are listening, you know, probably know about the master's tobacco settlement, mm -hmm. uh, which was um, in the 90s, which, uh, you know, which held the tobacco industry accountable for what had happened with cigarettes and marketing. And of course, um, all of that important work, the advocacy, the settlement, you know, appeared with youth to have gone up in a, in, you know, for lack of a better term, a puff of smoke when Juul came on to the market um, in, you know, in 2016 and, you know, went after teens on social media, et cetera. But having said that, um, would there be any benefit to a master's type tobacco settlement, either just with Juul or again, with the tobacco industry, um, I know that there's uh, that this is very complicated. That that the money, you know, it depended on states didn't always were not always required to use money for tobacco education, et cetera. But people often ask us that, and um, and I'd like to ask you, you know, how coordinated uh, are these suits about Jewel and potentially about other bad actors, um, and and should should we be uh, pushing for that? What is your thought? Uh, in terms of a multi-state effort against Juul, that is happening. As I, I said, yes. about a dozen other AGs have sued. A couple of them have had resolutions uh, in addition to North Carolina. And the rest of them are all part of a collective investigation. Um, and so that, you know, I, I think that there very well may be a national settlement as it relates to Juul. The complexity of doing the industry-wide resolution like what happened with tobacco in the um, late 1990s is that the markets are different. I mean, with cigarettes is there were a few very large players and then a handful of smaller players, but it was a defined number in the universe for the whole industry. And so honestly, it's easier to wrangle when, they are, when there are just a few big actors um, with these e-cigarette companies, there are so many and the cost of creating one is not that great. The, the barriers to entry are not very large. And so it just makes wrangling all of the actors into an industry-wide settlement much more challenging, I believe, than what happened in the tobacco uh, world or what's happening in the opioid space today. You know, there were three major distributors. There are three major pharmacy companies. There were maybe five or six major manufacturers that's complicated but it's doable um e-cigarette space i think is just much more complex that said that's why we've been pushing so hard on the fda because the fda can create rules that apply to the entire industry um, in one fell swoop and so i think putting y'all's effort behind more pressure on the FDA is a more constructive way to spend your time than trying to get the state AGs to do a master settlement agreement with all e-cigarette manufacturers. Because like we've mentioned a couple of different times, it really is a game of whack-a-mole. 
Right. And on, on your point, by the way, the FDA's recent court filing saying that they're not going to they, they're not going to be fi finalized with that until 2023. They actually are very specific about a handful of companies. They have not they have gotten rid to their credit. They have gotten rid of lots of the uh, the little guys with their, you know, very obviously kid friendly flavors like Captain Crunch and the old unicorn poop that everyone talked about, you know, in the beginning. Um, it, it actually is extremely troubling that they have not ruled on the flavored applications, the menthol, applica menthol applications, et cetera, from the market leaders. And it does raise the question, are these market leaders able to, um, you know, use their financial influence to uh, by a lack of oversight, why are we waiting for it? Because there are now, there's been a huge shakeout through this regulatory process with FDA. It really is that there is, I mean, I, I, to your point, there were many more bad, there are enough bad actors in this field for for, for everything. Yeah. Um, but there now, we're, to, we're waiting on the big market leaders. So it may be that uh, there that there has been a shakeout, but I understand your point um, that it is it is more complicated. Well, I just want to thank you, um, Josh, for um, caring so deeply about this topic, which we knew and you discussed with us last year as a parent yourself um, and as a public servant, you know, that you were so focused on protecting the kids of your state of North Carolina um, uh, with the settlement, but also more broadly. So we really wanna thank you again for your time, for your effort. And I have to say, because as the national parent voice, in this space, we also really want to encourage you to continue investigating Puff Bar, to continue going after those who profited enormously from Jewel, and to encourage, we hope, your colleagues to do so. We need uh, leaders and voices um, like yours in this way. So thank you so much for joining us, and we um, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Meredith. Thank you.